thank you to Ilka and also thank you to Nick for inviting me. And Nick told me I have as much time as I want. So I just started adding like tons of slides. And so if anyone wants to drop out, they can just drop out. So my name is Paul Hudson and I'm from KTH, which is the Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm. And I will talk about our work on metabolic engineering and new project we have where we're trying to study metabolite regulation of the Calvin cycle, which is the engine of carbon metabolism in cyanobacteria. So in my group, we actually study two types of bacteria. One is the cyanobacteria and the other is actually lithoautotrophic bacteria. And these are bacteria that fix carbon dioxide using the Calvin cycle, but they oxidize hydrogen for that. So we're working with two types of bacteria that fix carbon dioxide. Uh, and there's many applications for this. So of course, the primary one would be to biorefine carbon dioxide using these types of bacteria. But we can also find application in plant growth. So transferring cyanobacterial genes to plants, for example, enzymes has been done and other more exotic applications. But we were mostly interested in this one, engineering the cyanobacteria to produce something. So in my group, we've done a lot of this metabolic engineering, and I show here the kind of cycle that we've been following. So we start with the cyanobacteria wild type strain, let's say, and we perform this type of systems biology. So we study the cyanobacteria using like omics technology. So this could be metabolomics, proteomics, and we can model the metabolism in the computer. And from this, we get a sort of model that is informed from the omics data. So enzyme levels, metabolite levels. The genome, of course, is also an input here. And using that model, we can compute types of tasks to perform to change the metabolism. So these types of mutation tests, and then we get to synthetic biology, where we want to try to execute those mutations to improve the productivity of the strain. And here we've worked a lot with CRISPR interference. I'll talk a little bit about this today. We've done some work adding novel enzymes to new functions into the strain that doesn't exist. And what we're trying to move into my group now is more enzyme engineering. So modifying the native enzymes so that their regulation is different. And that's kind of the main focus of my talk today. And we get out of this an altered metabolism. And of course we have to do the cycle uh, again and again. And it used to be, of course, that this cycle would take a long, long time. I mean, you could do one cycle for one PhD maybe, but nowadays, and just accelerating now our ability to do all of these things is much faster now. You usually do many in parallel and try to build a knowledge base that way. So either in parallel through in one lab or in parallel in all of our labs where we use each other's data and information to improve these models. So I wanted to have a plug for CRISPR interference because we spent a lot of time in my group on CRISPR interference and it's a very powerful tool, but CRISPR interference was our way to execute a gene knockout. I, I mean, CRISPR interference is more of a gene knockdown instead of a knockout. Now we can actually do CRISPR-Cas mutagenesis. So we can do knockouts. I don't show that here. I'm mostly showing the knockdown. So the CRISPR interference uses the dead Cas9. So the catalytically inactive version of the Cas9, it sits on the gene. It's guided by a guide RNA and it blocks transcription. So it's a knockdown. And we demonstrated this in cyanobacteria. Just, we did not invent this technology. Of course, this was Nobel Prize winning technology developed some years before we started using it, but we ported it to cyanobacteria. And this is an example of us repressing GFP by inducing the DCAS9 in synecocystis. And you can see that we add the inducer at time zero and GFP is repressed. We remove the inducer after four days and the GFP recovers. So it shows that we can control gene expression using CRISPR-I. And we've done this in multiplex in a few publications. We then wanted to sort of put this system on steroids. So we generated a library of guide RNAs. So this is a 20,000 at some point we had uh, synthesized on, on a chip. And then we put them into the cyanobacteria and we get a sort of mutation library where every cell contains one guide RNA targeting a single gene. So this is kind of like a knockout library, but it's a knockdown library. And it's a mutant pool. And then all the cells are together in this big pool. And you can compete them against each other for growth so that you can see, do any of these knockdowns grow faster than average? Do any grow slower than average? In what conditions would one grow faster than the other? So it's a way to gauge gene importance, this CRISPR library. We also can sort the library based on a phenotype. So for example, we're interested in bioproduction. 
and we can screen the library using a droplet microfluidic device, and we can pick out members of the library that overproduce the chemical we're screening for. So I show an example of that. We have a new paper on BioArchive about this actually just out uh, last month. So how we can use CRISPR-I for metabolic engineering. In this example, we are using a lactate secreting strain. So this is a synecoschistus that's synthesizing lactate. It's a simple compound. It's easy to detect. Thing system looks like this. It's a droplet microfluidic sorting system. So we have the pool of cyanobacteria here in the tube. We encapsulate single cells into droplets. This is on a microfluidic chip. We let the cells incubate. Each cell is secreting lactate into its droplet. And after some time, we can inject the droplets with a detection assay, a fluorescence-based assay. And then we can sort the droplets using uh, FACs or FADs, it's called fluorescence activated droplet sorting. And then we can sequence the mutants that have been sorted out as high producers, and we can find which knockdowns improve the rate of lactate production. So going back to the idea of a metabolic model, of course, the metabolic model can help you predict this. It will tell you where to go and, and maybe which genes should be knocked down. But here you also get experimental verification and you see other genes that the model maybe didn't predict because the model wasn't accurate. You need to use the two together. So in this example, we found many clones that appeared to increase the amount of lactate that the cells were producing. A few of them were a bit obvious. So in one example, the phosphoketolase repression of this probably prevents a bypassing of pyruvate so that knocking it down or knocking it out allows more pyruvate to accumulate, which allows more lactate, which is derived from pyruvate. Another one is citrate synthase, where we think that blocking or repressing citrate synthase causes accumulation of acetyl-CoA and accumulation of pyruvate and probably more lactate because of this. And there were others that were a bit more difficult to predict. Knockdowns in the NDH complex, for example, appear to increase the lactate production. This could be justified on the basis of ATP and NADPH usage. And then also the nitrogen uptake, which we think maybe stimulates a type of PHB production in the cell, which maybe goes through this route and gives lactate instead when we have lactate. So we try to motivate these. But the GLTA repression, the citrate synthase, this is actually an incredible tool because repressing the GLTA actually shuts off biomass production. So it growth arrests the cells. So you can see here that cells that do not have the GLTA guide RNA they grow normally, but when you induce that, the cells stop growing. This is OD. And we see that the lactate amount goes up comparatively. Actually, when you do this growth arrest, almost 90% of the carbon that's fixed is going to lactate. So very little is going to biomass. So we're trying to work to optimize these types of growth arrest switches now using CRISPR-I and other tools as well. This is not the main thing I wanted to talk about, but I wanted to give you an idea of the transcriptional regulation that we're working on for metabolic engineering. And then in, in the second part of my talk now, I want to talk more about the metabolite level regulation, or the kind of post-translational regulation that we are also interested in, which can also serve as a tool in metabolic engineering. So that the motivation for this is I mean, in hindsight, I'm going to give you the motivation is something like this, that we know that many enzymes in central carbon metabolism are allosterically regulated. So a really good example, I think, is this phosphofructokinase uh, that's in glycolysis and typically in mammalian cells. This enzyme is extremely complex and it's extremely well studied. And it turns out that it's extremely regulated by many different metabolites in the cell. So, I mean, it's really the gateway to glycolysis. You can see all the inputs into the activity of this enzyme. And one of them that I think is kind of like telling is that the AMP stimulates the enzyme. And this is because the AMP is the readout of the energy status in mammalian cells. I mean, also in E. coli. When it's low energy, it stimulates the enzyme to perform more glycolysis. We don't really know that much about carbon fixation when it comes to allosteric regulation. So we know in carbon fixation in photosynthesis, we know about light regulation through disulfide bonds, but we don't know that much about metabolite level regulation, if there is any, and how prominent it is. I found a paper, I don't read in this field widely, but if you mutate phosphofructokinase, it's one of the contributors to cancer. So this enzyme, when it becomes ungated through a mutation, there's a correlation with cancer there. So I start thinking if we can somehow mutate regulation in carbon fixation, maybe we can give our cyanobacteria a type of cancer, which means they become hyperproductive.
this is a loose analogy, but I think you can see the, the motivation here. And in the field of metabolic engineering, there is evidence that mutating regulation of enzymes, like their kinetic parameters, their inhibition constants, this can be a fruitful avenue. So there's two well-known examples. And, and one of them is that the pyruvate dehydrogenase in E. coli is inhibited by NADH. And so having a mutant version of that enzyme that is insensitive to NADH, it opens up like high flux through the enzyme and that leads to many products. So they're using this in Genomatica, for example. This is a very like standard mutation in pyruvate dehydrogenase to push flux through that enzyme in E. coli. And I think maybe in yeast as well. Now it's starting to also be explored more allosteric feedback regulation of amino acid biosynthesis. A lot of groups are working on producing amino acids from microbes, at not least cyanobacteria. And then it turns out that some of these biosynthesis enzymes are feedback inhibited through allosteric, through the product. So the mechanism of this in cyanobacteria is not well known, but it is known in E. coli and, and this can be modulated. Uh, and the third example is just an, an example of changing the affinity constant of an enzyme in E. coli that allowed the Calvin cycle to be functional in E. coli. It required a change in the affinity. Tuning these parameters, not necessarily KCAT now of an enzyme, not necessarily the turnover number, but its inhibition properties, right? This can be a fruitful avenue for metabolic engineering. So in my group now, we have two PhD students that are working on optimizing methodologies for detecting these types of interaction in cyanobacteria. And one of the methodologies uses what's called limited proteolysis. So you extract the proteome from the cells, you treat them with a metabolite of interest. So this is the one you think might be interacting. You add it to the proteome extract, and then you do a partial digestion of the proteome and you run it on the mass spectrometer. And if that metabolite interacted with a protein, it may affect the digestion patterns that you will see the change in the digestion pattern from the mass spectrometry data. And this can indicate that that metabolite interacted with that protein. There are other possibilities, but that's a very likely thing that the metabolite interacted with that protein. Another method that we're working on is called the PISA method. And this relies on a change in the thermal stability of one of the proteins when you add the metabolite. So it's, it's a measure of proteins with the idea that if a metabolite binds to a protein, it can change its melting temperature. So these are two kind of complementary methods that are proteome wide to detect interactions of proteins with metabolites. So enzymes with potential allosteric effectors. My two students, Emil and Anna, they've been working on optimizing these. These were originally developed for other purposes, but we're working on optimizing them in cyanobacteria. We also have some work in plants as well, applying these. I will give you the story of using one of these methods. And this is a preprint that we have now on BioArchive. And we have done this LIPSMAP method, this limited proteolysis method, testing in Cynicocystis primarily, and also some other bacteria. So some of these lithoautotrophs as well. The, the details of this, uh, I will leave out some things, but it can be found at the paper that's up on BioArchive. I will go through some of this. And the idea was that we wanted to find potential allosteric effectors for the central carbon metabolism in cyanobacteria. So this is an example of what the data look like. So here, this is for Cynicocystis. Now we've added AMP. So this energy status metabolite, we've added AMP. So we can just look at this first one. And this volcano plot is showing peptides from the proteome of Cynicocystis that are altered when the metabolite was added. So these are coming from proteins that are probably being affected by AMP. We see DNA kinase here. Some of them are known interactors and some of them are unknown. When we add a lot of AMP, we get more interaction. When we add cyclic AMP, so this is a more signaling metabolite, it's not really known as an enzyme effector. We see a couple interactions, but really not that many. Of course, when we add a lot, we, we start to see more interactions. But the idea here is that there's a difference between these two. And it's kind of as we would expect that cyclic AMP probably does not have many targets in the cell, or if it does, it's low abundant targets, whereas AMP is more known as an enzyme effector. The data is proteome wide, so we can look at all proteins and see where there are interactions from these metabolites to these proteins. So here we can get what we call mug shots of each strain. And these are the four different strains that we tested. The greens are the cyanobacteria. The purples are the lithoautotrophs. These are the enzymes. These are the Calvin cycle enzymes. And these are enzymes kind of adjacent to the Calvin cycle in the metabolic map. 
And the details you can look at in the manuscript, but I just show as an example that ATP interacts with many proteins across all organisms. You see over here, these metabolites such as 2-oxyglutarate, this is an intermediate from the EDA pathway. They maybe are a little more specific for the lithoautotrophic ones and not the cyanobacteria. So there are some patterns that appear that some metabolites are interacting more with one strain than the others, but in general, there's a lot of interactions that we maybe did not expect. So I will now narrow in on, on what I think is kind of an important interaction that we saw. And we turned our focus to the enzyme FBPase. It's a bifunctional enzyme in the Calvin cycle. So I show where it is here. This is one of the controlling steps of the Calvin cycle. So it's been shown that the level of this enzyme, the activity of this enzyme can really affect the growth of the cyanobacteria and it can affect the amount of products that are produced if you're doing metabolic engineering. So we think this is a very important enzyme in the Calvin cycle. There are other important enzymes, of course, but this is the one that we really focused on. And the LIP data showed uh, several metabolites that were interacting with this enzyme. And I highlight here the peptide that showed up in the mass spectrometer for where these metabolites might be binding. AMP is actually a known inhibitor of the enzyme. ATP, NADPH, GAP, glyceraldehyde phosphate, it's an intermediate of the Calvin cycle. Citrate, none of these were known before to be affecting the enzyme activity. So we purified the enzyme and we tested the actual effect. So just because they're binding or they're interacting, it doesn't mean that they're actually affecting the activity. So. We purify the enzyme and we test, we do Michaelis Menten type genetic plots for the enzyme and we see, aha, the addition of GAP stimulates the enzyme. So it, it actually lowers the KM. So it's a stimulator. The addition of NADPH, oh, it inhibits the enzyme. I mean, this is not a huge effect, but it, it's a reproducible and it's a measurable effect. A and P, as I said, it completely inhibits the enzyme at this concentration. So that it's way down here. Yeah. So this just shows that in this case, a lot of the interactions we saw, they did have an effect on the enzyme kinetics. Interestingly, taking the FDPase from Cuprivitis, one of the lithoautotrophs that also uses the Calvin cycle, but it's not photosynthetic, it showed the same pattern. So glyceraldehyde phosphate stimulates that enzyme and NADPH uh, inhibits that enzyme. And this enzyme, it has low homology, low sequence homology to the synecocystis enzyme, but these effects are the same in both. This suggests to us, oh, it's some sort of convergent evolution. Maybe it's a conserved thing, this types of regulation. We also showed that adding glyceraldehyde phosphate changes the melting temperature slightly of the enzyme. So that's the difference between green and yellow. And here we did it at different magnesium concentrations because the enzyme is in the magnesium. You see at all concentrations, addition of glyceraldehyde phosphate, it changes the melting temperature. So this is a real interaction now. We use the thermal proteome profiling, this PISA method. We added glyceraldehyde phosphate, the complementary detection method for interactions. And we see that GAP actually interacts with many different enzymes. So this is a separate method, not LIP anymore. It's, it's a complementary method that kind of confirms the data. Of course, adding ATP. Again, many proteins are affected by ATP. This is known. We did not know this many were affected by glyceraldehyde phosphate. Transketolase uses it as a substrate that might actually be affected then that it, it shows an effect, but not all of these do that. So where does GAP sit in the Calvin cycle? I mean, glyceraldehyde phosphate, it's kind of an early product in the Calvin cycle. So what we're seeing is that it's stimulating a downstream enzyme. So this is the type of feed forward regulation in the Calvin cycle. And the effect is such that GAP is increasing the activity of the enzyme 75%. This is not a tenfold stimulation, you know, some enzymes, when they're allosterically activated, it can be tenfold increase, you know, fivefold increase. This is not that high, but as I said, it, it's true. It's there. We also found that when we remove DTT, so FBPase is a redox regulated enzyme. When we remove that from the assay and we treat it with GAP again, we see the activity is decreased. So this is like, wait a minute, in the oxidized form of the enzyme, GAP is kind of an inhibitor. And, but we think what happens is that when DTT is not present, GAP is stimulating aggregation of the enzyme. So we don't know the physiological relevance of this part, but we're still trying to explore that. But we do know through light scattering that the enzyme becomes aggregated when you add GAP when it, in the oxidized condition, which would be nighttime, but it doesn't aggregate in the reduced condition, which would be like daytime. So here we have an interesting thing where if we put it in physiological context, maybe GAP, uh, glyceraldehyde phosphate though, is repressing this enzyme. 
And that actually could make sense. I mean, in glycolysis, we know that glycolysis maybe would happen at night in cyanobacteria. And if it was going through the phosphofructokinase, you really need this enzyme turned off. FDPH has to be off because otherwise it's a conflict in activity. And of course, it, it does become redox regulated at night. The enzyme is supposed to be off, but we know it's not fully off. We, we know this from in vitro activity data. So maybe this is a mechanism to make sure that it's off. But again, we're still studying this part, actually. So the gap would be like one of these two-headed coins, you know, like two-face. It's good in the daytime and it's bad in the nighttime. But of course, evolutionarily, it would be that it's good. It's just good in both sets. But for us, it's kind of interesting that you would stimulate it in one condition and inhibit in the other. So the implications of this type of regulation is a bit complex. I will just say that we've done a bit of modeling of the cyanobacteria. And when you add this regulation back to our model, we see that the effect of it is that it gives even more importance to this FBPase enzyme because it stimulates the activity. So when the FBPase is regulated by glyceraldehyde phosphate like this, the flux control coefficient of this enzyme, so its influence over other reactions in the cycle increases. It makes the enzyme very important indeed. So this is showing that a slight increase of FBPase activity stimulates all the other enzymes in the cycle. This one can really pull flux through the cycle if you increase its activity, and which kind of fits with experimental data showing that overexpression of the enzyme can lead to an increase in growth rate and also productivity. So the details of this are not that important for right now, but we're trying to incorporate this back into our models. So to summarize, we are now on the verge of having a lot of new information about how enzymes in the Calvin cycle are regulated. So using these methods, we've discovered several new inhibitions and activations in the cycle. So GAP is the example I went in on, but there are others, of course, that we've also validated. However, so far, many of the enzyme interactions that we've shown they're not strong. Only AMP reduced activity totally. So it's not like we're seeing tenfold activation or total inhibition, not from the ones we've tested so far. So it appears that these methods are very sensitive, meaning that they can detect interactions that might not affect the catalytic activity. I think it's good to have these types of multiple methods to validate this. I mean, each method has its weakness. So we found that relying on one screening method can lead you down the false path sometimes. So it's quite good to have multiple methods to detect these. And I mentioned like giving cells cancer, but when you start affecting these types of regulatory kinetic parameters, like the inhibition constant, so you remove an allosteric regulation, let's say through mutagenesis, well, we can expect that this maybe increases the flux toward your product, but it will also likely decrease the robustness of your cell. These things are there for a reason. We just have to keep that in mind that when we start tinkering with this type of control, it could lead to less robust cells, but maybe in a bioreactor, we don't need robustness. I, I don't know yet. This is kind of where we would hope to go, where we, we map these regulations. We do some sort of validation or inference that they're true. We mutate the enzymes in a clever way, of course. And then we get new types of Calvin cycle modules that are more conducive to bioproduction. So yeah, I thank you for paying attention and thanks again for the invitation. I just point out that we're looking to expand the group. So if you're interested in working with our team, then you can write me an email or you can go to our, our website and apply. And I'm happy to answer any questions.